our uh, next guest is none other than Vern Steiner. Vern was appointed as a president and CEO of State Fund on June 9, 2014. Mm -hmm. Vern has 30 years of insurance industry experience, the majority in workers' compensation. As the president and CEO, he reports directly to the board of directors and is responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of State Fund. Vern began his career uh, around 1990, I believe, as a claims examiner. Early in his career, Vern experienced the workers' compensation system from the point of view of a third-party administrator, a self-insured, self-administered employer, and a managed care organization. In 1995, Vern joined AIG as a service center manager, and by 2003, when he left AIG, he was a regional vice president, Northwest. He worked for CNA for 2003 to 2007, starting as the VP, field operation, and ultimately vice president, workers' compensation. Vern served as a senior VP claims at Zenith Insurance from 2007 to 2014. Vern has an impressive background and a ultimate authority in workers' comp as well as the insurance related to employer-employee relationship. Uh, Vern received his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from University of California, Los Angeles. And Mr. Steiner, it's our pleasure to present you to the audience. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Bobby. So I've been asked to talk a bit today about how State Fund has achieved 25% of our workforces as persons with disabilities. So I'll start and maybe say something a little controversial. And uh, the most important component of our success is not the direct result of any specific plan. But we do have a plan. Uh, so I'm going to share that with you. And then I'll explain my earlier comment after sharing the plan. So we, all, we also have a robust disability advisory committee, and it's charged with developing, coordinating, implementing awareness events and educational programs. It's charged with providing a forum that, employ, uh, that emphasizes the cap capabilities of persons with disabilities, and it's charged with measuring these efforts to improve employment opportunities and development for persons with disabilities. And our, our Disability Advisory Committee uh, designs um, events and they promote, during these events, they promote the CalHR Change in Disability Status Survey. And I, I think that is kind of, kind of an important element of our success and it ties into some of the other things I'm going to share with you, people's willingness to share uh, information like that uh, in, in our culture. Um, since we started working from home, our Disability Advisory Committee has continued to host events. Uh, in 2021, they have already or will host events related to the American Heart Month, Autism Awareness Month, Better Hearing and Speech Month, Alzheimer Awareness Month, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, National Disability Employment Awareness, and Movember Men's Health Month. Our Disability Awareness Committee um, and our EOC and our Center of Culture has been um, instrumental in developing hiring process workshops for supervisors and managers that incorporate content on why diversity and inclusion is an important uh, element to the success of our organization. But I already said that these were not the most important contributing factors to our success. So I, I'm Probably going to get a little bit off topic uh, for you here, but I really think that this this is the engine that drives you know all the success we have at State Fund, but particularly the approach to inclusiveness, you know, regardless of, of background. Um, you've probably heard uh, by now the statement that culture eats strategy for lunch. Well. I've never heard anything that turns out to be more true when you're trying to lead successful teams. So at State Fund, culture is actually part of our strategy. It's the most important part of our strategy. We intentionally build a culture that will not only enable our plans to work, 
but that will encourage our people to want to do more. So how do we do that? We start with why we're here. When, as Bobby shared, most of my background before the last seven years was in private industry. And when I came to State Fund, there it was a wildly different experience. I heard someone comment earlier how different the private sector is from state employment. And the tools available to lead an organization are really far more limited. And what you're left with in state service is really the most difficult tools, but the most effective tools, right? You, there are no shortcuts. You can't just make things happen through wholesale change, removing of people, buying of talent. You have to, you really have to work from the, the base and build yourself up. And the most important, I think, asset we have, uh, certainly a state fund, and I think throughout the state, is our purpose, right? Most of us, especially the people we want to have be part of our organization, they want to make a difference. They want to do something important. They want to be helpful. So we start with why we're here. And the state fund was created 107 years ago when the workers' compensation system was being created. And the way I interpret that, the intent behind that creation is we were created to help make the workers' compensation system work. Now, over, over 107 years, we're not necessary for the workers' compensation system to work anymore. Other states have figured out how to do it without a state fund. Uh, so our remaining purposes and, and probably the thing that keeps us viable is we need to help make the system work better. And at the, at the root of that is that drive to help. So we start with this, this purpose that we're here to help. And then we try to create a, a guiding principle so that everyone understands what, what we're all about. And that guiding principle we came up with four or five years ago, we call it our North Star. And it's a pretty simple uh, principle. We are driven to help others and to do the right thing. Yeah. And Every problem we face, and that when you're at work, pretty much all you're doing is solving problems all the time. Every interaction with an injured worker, because that is our business, is to help people who have been injured at work. So we're in the business of helping people manage and live with and, and get through, in some cases, their disability. Every one of those uh, interactions, in fact, every one of the interactions we have with each other internally I encourage everyone in the organization and I encourage our leadership team and I try my best as well to start with, how can we help? That's, that's the question. That's the drive behind everything we do. And the only limitations in, in our drive to help is whether or not it turns out to be right. And that, that can be very complicated. Um, we have to be fair. You know, we have to do things that in the long term will make sure that we're still here to be helpful. But, but that driven, that, that drive to be helpful is the under, underlying reason, Ning, I should say, reasoning behind everything that we do. So after we have that guiding principle, we, we created some core values. You know, what are the things that we value at, at State Fund? Organizations have been doing this for years, and you, you hear things like, oh, we value integrity, we value uh, adaptability, uh, we doubt, value creativity. Well, we, we uh, created a different set of core values. We have four. You know, the first one is to do what is right. Second one is to be innovative. Yeah, we want to encourage people to be creative, to be owners in the organization, to really feel responsible for this mission of being helpful. The next one is to respect everybody. And the last one is to show that we care. And I hope you can see how these core values together with the North Star, you know, really support an environment where we're always focused on creating an atmosphere where people are welcome and they can make a difference, what, where they, what they have to say matters. And, uh, and that, again, is part of our strategy. Because we talked about the earlier, what our Disability Advisory Committee is charged with. 
I also made the comment uh, that culture eats strategy for lunch. And, and I think that the thing that I've taken away from that over the years is you can have the best plan in the world, but if you aren't able to execute it well, the plan doesn't really make a bit of difference. If you have an okay plan, but you're great at execution, you're great at getting it done, you, you'll be better off. Now, it's wonderful to have a great plan and great execution, um, and we, we, that's what we achieve for. But when we're, what, when we're trying to balance what is the most important thing is that culture piece, because the culture piece enables us to execute better. People really buy into what we're trying to do. They feel like they're doing something special. So all these are, are really still just words. So I thought I'd share with you some examples of how we put these words into action. And you know, sadly, we've had a, you know, a test of our, our North Star and a test of our core values over the course of the past 16, 17 months when the pandemic began, right? Every, I think no one was ready for the pandemic when it hit in March of last year, you know, and, and that, that includes us, or at least we didn't think we were ready. Um, and yet it came ready or not. And we had several issues that we had to figure out how to deal with right away. We had to figure out first, what do we do with our workforce? We, we have people all over the state of California and I believe it was the week of March 17th or 18th last year when we had some of the Bay Area counties starting to uh, say, hey, hey, everyone's going to shelter in place. Well, we had already sent the message to our organization that we were sending people home. We didn't wait for that. The, the message from the counties made us kind of accelerate our plan a little bit. Uh, and we were able to do that and get everyone home you know, really within a week of, of that shelter in place statewide. How we did that, we fortunately, we were able to leverage a plan that we had in place because we listened to what our employees want wanted. And uh, we had been working for the last year to put in the infrastructure to support a work from home program. We actually plan to have a one day work from home program in starting in 2020. We we're going to start piling it in May, but uh, suddenly we had to have a five days a week work from home program uh, for everyone yeah, in March of 2020. It, had we not had the kind of culture where we were listening to our people and understanding what they wanted and valued that what they wanted, um, we wouldn't have had the infrastructure in place that would allow us to send everyone home and really not miss a beat. So we took care of our our employees, you know, first during this pandemic because we knew that we wouldn't be able to take care of any of our other obligations until we took care of our employees. Once we had got them working from home, the care of the employees wasn't finished, right? We had an environment where people really didn't know what to do working from home. They didn't have the same sense of connection as they had before. The whole world had changed and they had all kinds of fears. The state was starting to talk about a budget crisis. People were afraid about for their jobs. They didn't know what was going to happen to their income. We had all these kinds of issues. We had parents now that had their children work you know, at home while they were working. Just We could have said, hey, people just got to figure that out. That's the new environment. But we didn't. We said, how can we help our people get through these kinds of issues? And we implemented various programs. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll name some of them. We put into place a a program where if people didn't have the right equipment at home, we would pay for it. Now, we're different than a lot of other state organizations and we don't operate on any taxpayer dollars. We operate purely on the premium dollars we charge our customers and people don't have to be insured with state fund. And we also operate on the investment income we make from the money we take in insurance. It takes us a while to pay it out. So we're able to invest it over time. And we've been very careful with our financial resources. So we were in a position to say, okay, people are going to need some equipment to work from home. And we're going to go ahead and help them get that because we weren't even letting them come into the office. They didn't have access to you know, whatever kinds of reasonable accommodations and equipment we had bought them in the office wasn't available. 
And many people were living in small apartments with no desk space and never had a need for a desk. We had some people who didn't have internet connections. We got involved and we started helping to solve those problems. Now, that's kind of the most basic thing, but there was a more, I think, long-term problem that we were concerned about. And that was, how are people going to feel during all this? You know, I'm such a big believer in culture and we were very reliant on our office environment to drive that culture. And now we didn't have our office environment. It was clear to me from the beginning that it wasn't going to be for six weeks. It was going to be for six or 18 months, which turns out to have been true. Uh, the only reason I knew that is because I read a lot of science fiction and there's a lot of information on pandemics in those novels. So I was kind of seeing ahead of the curve there. And we decided we've got to do something to really help our people emotionally through this process. So we created all kinds of opportunities, you know, through Zoom, which we had virtually day one, to for people to connect, not for work. You know, it was a connection with others at work, but not to work. Let's play a game online. Let's, you know, unrelax and let's figure out... Um, you know, how to do an art project together. You know, let's just have an informal connection and eat lunch, you know, and do it together online because the, this need for human connection is something that everyone was going to be missing, you know, during the pandemic. And we were doing our best to try to feed that, that need that our employees would have. And, you know, initially what we had our leadership team do is reach out to everybody daily and, not to make sure they were doing their job, to make sure that they were. I don't know if I was muted intentionally, <laughs> so I'm taking myself off mute now. Let me know if you want me to stop for a while. Um, so we were we reached out to every employee daily just to make sure that they were okay, and not to make sure that they were doing their job. We told employees, you know what? We don't care what hours you work, unless your job is to man a phone you know, and answer it between the hours of eight to five, because that's what the regulation requires. You, you have some flexibility. You know, we still need to get our job done. We need to take care of injured workers and we need to take care of our customers, but you can figure out how to make this work in your environment. And eventually we also uh, started doing things to help people with their children being at home. You know, everyone was uh, schooling from home through Zoom or other uh, similar uh, technology. And parents had to balance all these things. So we created a program where we hired students that were interested in education to create an experience for the children of our employees so that they could get some tutoring, just connect with other children, get to know them and have some sort of connection and have some fun. And we, in, in doing that, we found a whole bunch of students that we would love to have be future employees of State Fund because... They were so effective at this that we got incredible an incredible number of compliments from the parents um, about the the experience that their children had had through this program we created. And we did many others. I, I, I know that I don't have forever here. So a lot of programs focused on our employees. But that was part of the idea behind we need to keep this culture working because we're here ultimately to help our customers and injured workers. So what did we do? To, to live our North Star and core values for our customers and injured workers. Well, you might recall that when the pandemic first hit, people were talking about, well, is it a work-related injury? And for years and years, the law had been pretty well established in California and almost the entire country that if you're not at more risk going to work, for catching a disease in the general po uh, population, then it's not work-related. And that was the line that most uh, insurance companies were taking. We decided to take a different approach, particularly during the shelter-in-place order. We said, if you're an essential worker going to work, we're going to cover you. No questions asked. You know, we, we put some limitations on how much coverage. You know, we said, we're going to pay your temporary disability. We're going to pay your medical treatment. We didn't necessarily buy into the long-term permanent disability if, if it was there. Eventually, uh, the governor issued his emergency order and laws followed. And we really set the tone for that and what we were, what we were willing to do for injured workers. 
And that made our employees feel good about what they were doing, which feeds back into that cultural loop. We also said, okay, we've got employers out there and we're here. We exist to serve these employers. Now they have all these costs in order to the safety costs, you know, plexiglass shields, cleaning, masks, whatever they might be. And you know, they're struggling to survive and they weren't ready for this. And so we decided to cr- create a grant program for our employers uh, that any customer of, our, customer of ours, we would pay them 10, 000, up to $10,000. It was either $10,000 or twice what they paid us in premium if it was a smaller number. Um, and we would pay them that in order to cover their safety-related, COVID safety-related costs. We did that first for the essential um, employers, and then we did it for all of our other employers when the economy started to reopen. So that made our employees feel incredibly good as well, because as our customers started to get these checks and they would send the application into our employees, they would then say, thank you. This is so incredibly helpful. This is going to keep us alive. And we got hundreds and hundreds of thank you notes that shared these stories. And we posted them so that all of our employees could read them and feel good about their mission and what they were doing. So this cultural piece is key to the strategy. And you can see that in embedded in the culture is this caring inclusiveness, um, that really accepting everyone and valuing everyone for what they have to offer and knowing that each and every one of the employees at State Fund are absolutely essential to what we do. What I often tell our, our teams are, you know, we don't, we, we have to compete with private carriers, but we don't get to compete on a level playing field. The state tells us what product we're able to offer. We don't get to very be creative there. We can't be an Apple and create this incredible customer experience based on innovating and getting brand new products that no one else has or improving on other people's products. All we can do is provide a workers' compensation product, help injured workers recover. And the only way we can differentiate ourselves is by doing it through human contact, human caring better than all the other companies. And we're perfectly situated to do that because our reason for existing is to help. Whereas if you're a private insurance carrier, your reason for existing is to make a profit. You can still be helpful in that process, but we have kind of the moral high ground for making our employees feel good about what they're doing. And that is the approach we take to pretty much everything at State Fund. And, and I think that comes back to as we took a look at what do we need to do to make sure that we're giving people uh, with disabilities equal opportunities and we're giving them the opportunity to contribute you know, it, it feeds right into those core values and that North Star, and it enables us to execute on those plans, you know, frankly, better than we ever thought we would. I also want to come back a little bit to this, you know, making it easy for people to fill out the surveys. You know, at the end of the day, it all, every relationship boils down to trust, you know, whether it's a personal relationship or whether it's your work relationship. And the more you trust, the more you're willing to share. And it's, it's been an eye-opening experience, really, that people are willing to share. You know, we make it easy for them, and they're willing to share through this, the CalHR survey what their disability status is. And if they trusted us less, if we didn't behave the way we do across the whole spectrum of things I've described, I don't think that they would be as free sharing that information. And our numbers might seem to be lower, even though they aren't. That, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time for that. Absolutely, Vern. That was a fantastic presentation. We always have time uh, to present you with questions. And if you're generous enough to stay with us and answer those, that'll be great. So, in the, um, Vern, in the comments, we did have a couple of requests for, to start off with for your DAC charter, and um, we had Rosa did jump in and say that um, if you give her your email, she can share that so people can put, send that directly to her. Um, there was a question that was explained about what is North Star, um, and uh, uh, someone answered saying it's a guiding principle. Do you want to expand a little bit on what North Star is maybe? Yeah, it, it, 
Yes, I will. So when, when I joined the organization, you know, our purpose hasn't you know, changed really in 107 years that we've been exist- in existence. But I think as an organization, we were struggling to figure out what was most important. Was the most important thing you know, to protect state fund from all the fraud that exists in the workers' compensation system so that we could be around for another 100 years? What, what was the most important thing? And we, we decided we needed to make that as clear as possible. And we started with why we exist, uh, that, and we exist to help make the workers' compensation system work. And that, that word help had to be at the heart of our North Star. So we wanted to make it as easy for everyone as possible whenever they're faced with a problem. And one of the problems could be rules that we've created over our 107-year history, because I've learned that you know, organizations that have been a long, around a long time have a lot of rules, and government has a lot of rules. And I actually have also learned that rules are very inhibiting. They can exist to inhibit the wrong behaviors, but they actually inhibit a lot of things. Yeah. And so what we said to people is whenever, whenever you're faced with a challenge, whenever you are faced with a rule that seems to conflict with this North Star, you know, let's talk about it so that we can get it right. And we said, and the, dr- the driving principle that we want everyone to understand is we're here to help others. That's it. What? That's when you're faced with a challenge, you start with how can I be helpful? It's a pretty simple principle. It's not always easy to do. And not everyone always sees being helpful in the same way. So we have a lot of dialogues about it in the organization. But that's, that's our driving principle. Whatever, whatever we're doing, whenever we create a strategy, when we decided to do the things we did to respond to the pandemic, we thought, what does our North Star tell us to do? And as long as we had the ability to be helpful without you know, ruining the organization so that we couldn't ever help again, we were going to do it. Um, also, we see a lot of uh, like thank yous and appreciation for your message because it's a beautiful message and I agree with the commenters. Would anybody like to unmute and ask a question? There's Tanya. This is Eduardo Juarez with um, DHCS. Um, so I'm also the co-chair for STEC. Um Also, um, I think part of the problem with trying to meet the quota for um, hiring um, a minimum of certain amount of employees with disabilities I think part of the problem is that um, a lot of folks don't want to admit that they have a disability, at least not to the state. They don't want to, I guess they don't want to document it or they're afraid to admit that. Um, I think that's part of the problem. Um, How did your um, office overcome that? So that's a great question, Eduardo. I I agree. I I think that 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 is a problem. And I alluded to it earlier. you know, people don't really want to share information sometimes ever, but not if they don't trust. Right? And um, we've, as an organization, identified that in order for us to succeed at anything we do, we have to earn the trust of our employees. So the this North Star and these core values, they're all kind of artifacts or a roadmap for how you behave so that you earn trust. Now, just having them isn't enough to earn the trust. You actually have to live them. And so over time, we've been living these things. And we, how do we measure this, right? So we, every year we conduct an employee survey. And you know, in 2014, uh, when I arrived, we had like 49% of our employees engaged. And you know, about that number or maybe even less that actually trusted management, particularly senior management. You know, last year when we took the survey, it's gone up every year. Last year, we had 84% of our employees engaged. And I think it was in the 80s trusting senior management as well. And the survey provider told us we're now actually above the, the median for the organizations that compete in their best places to work competition. You know, so over time, We've implemented these kinds of the North Star, the core values, and that's not enough. You've got to live it because you don't earn trust just by saying you're going to do something. You earn the trust by then doing what you say you're going to do. And the thing you say you're going to do and the thing you do 
has to be well-intentioned and have a positive impact on other people. And, and so that's, I think, opens up the window for people to say, okay, I'm going to share this information. And it isn't in any way, shape, or form, I think, limited to sharing information, filling out the survey for CalHR. I think it, it impacts pretty much everything we, we try to engage with and with our workforce. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, Vern, we had a question. Um, can we have a copy of the employee survey? It would, benef- it would be beneficial to share and fine-tune our, our, our own series. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I wasn't prepared for that question, but there's, I guess we should be proud of it. And I don't, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't, couldn't share last year's uh, survey with you. Is Rosa your contact person? Should we, um, can we pass on Bobby? So anybody want to contact Bobby? Um, that's how we normally do it. If we want to send on information, Bobby, does that sound good? Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. That's, <laughs> that's my main function. Uh, <laughs> Vern, uh, I really enjoyed, you know, the, the culture each strategy presentation. That should be the heading of your presentation. This is so deep rooted in your culture of your organization. And the results simply shows. The question I have, though, is that you came from a private background with large, you know, insurance carriers, large insurers into a state organization. How did you change the culture of your organization? That's a difficult job. Many departments are struggling to do that. It is, it is difficult. And it was, we weren't in a good place when I joined the organization. Uh, we had gone through some, it, I think tragically, state fund had done exactly what it was supposed to do. And it had been there for California employers when 29 different insurance companies went out of business and you know, the national carriers left the state. And so people had no other place to go to get workers' comp insurance. And this was in the early 2000s. And they came to state fund in droves. But this was actually during the time of the last recall, Governor Davis and another state budget crisis. There was a hiring freeze and state fund wasn't allowed to hire anyone during that time. We grew overnight by leaps and bounds and we didn't have the people to do it. And it left a lasting scar on the organization. It also left, left a lasting scar on our reputation with customers. They were, they were relieved to be able to get workers' compensation insurance, but then they were not very happy that whenever they called us, there was no one around to answer the phone. And there was, it wasn't state funds' fault. I mean, this is long before my time, but it was just some of the, I think, ironies and inconsistencies with having an organization like ours embedded in um, a government structure that is tax-based when we don't operate on tax dollars. But so that lasted a long time and trust with the organization was broken. The, the, the long story there is we grew like crazy. Eventually we hired, but then workers' comp was reformed and all the private carriers wanted back in and new private carriers were being created and our customers hated us and all of our customers left. And we had a, a workforce that was big enough to handle $8 billion of premium and be the largest workers' comp carrier in the country. And that's what we were, even though we were only in California. And then we dropped to about $900 million in premium. And we had more than twice as many people as we needed. And when you go through that kind of difficult change, you lose trust with your organization. And we had to rebuild that trust. And we did it in several ways. You couldn't do it overnight. There was no shortcut. Um, had I still been in a private organization, shortcuts would have been very tempting, but they just didn't exist here. When I say shortcuts, you know, in a private organization, we might have chosen, well, let's close that office. It's really bad. Let's rehire new people that don't have these memories. None of that was available. So what we had to do is we had to slowly earn people's trust. We had to show them that it was a new state fund. And we put people first. We, we understood that we had to create an employee experience that was superior. And I actually started with our human resources department. I went to our human resources department after about the first year, because we started to hire some new people in, in 2015. And those new people were telling me, what a horrible onboarding experience. Actually, that's not entirely true. A lot of them would say they had a horrible onboarding experience. And some said they had great. It was an inconsistent onboarding experience because... We had 
looked at expenses first and we decided we're going to have supervisors do the onboarding. Well, we have 700 and some managers and supervisors in our organization. And some of them haven't hired for 10 years and some of them really don't care that much. You know, so the, the experience was incredibly variable. And I said to our human resource team, your customer is our employees. And if we expect our employees to take good care of their customer, you have to take incredibly good care of our employees. And that starts with you only get, you know, full of cliches, you only get one chance to make a good first impression. That's what is, what do they feel when they show up at State Fund to be hired? So we created a, a standardized onboarding program. We, you know, we created a learning center in our back of the office. We only hire once a month. Everyone starts on the same day every month. Everyone, not during the pandemic, we've been doing it virtually for the last 15 months. Everyone comes to Vacaville and they spend four and a half days in Vacaville. They get guided through everything, benefits, culture, North Star, core values. Uh, they get guided through all the mandatory trainings they have to get to take, any questions they have. You know, we make sure that all of those questions are answered. And it also gives us the opportunity now that they're on board that by the time they get to their workstation, it's all set up and ready for them so that we can continue that, you know, good first impression. So everyone that has been, we've been bringing into the organization since 2016, early 2016, has gone through this process. And it's been a tremendous success. We've seen our turnover ratio fall, you know, it's almost nil. And uh, then these people who are in, actually happy to be a state fund and energized about the experience, that's kind of contagious. Um, and of course, we're also changing the way we've engaged with all of our workforce. I, I described some of those ways earlier, the, the things we did through the pandemic, but we've been doing that for quite some time. Um, just you have different tools uh, or different things available to you in a remote environment than when you're in an office. The other thing we do is we listen. You know, it's very easy to think you know all the answers. I fall into that trap regularly and um, I remind myself, I've got to listen. You know, you come up with a plan and you think, you know, you, you know what you intended with that plan, but then you communicate it and it gets executed by other people. And maybe the plan wasn't great. Maybe it wasn't understood the way you thought it was going to be understood. You've got to listen to what your employees are saying about how things are working and you have to be willing to change and make adjustments. Um, not everything. You know, sometimes employees don't like an idea, but you're convinced it's the right idea and you, you might feel like you need to stay the course. But if you listen, you're going to find lots of things that if you just do what the employees are saying, it's going to get better. And that has a double impact. People start to think that you actually listen, that what they have to say matters. And turns out the people that are closer to the work actually know more than I do. You know, and they know more than most managers do. And so you can actually get better at what you do when you approach things with that open mind. There's a lot more to it than that, Bobby, uh, but I could probably talk for days on this topic. But I think that's the core of how we accomplish it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving us. I just have one final question. I'm not going to take any more of your time. And that is, you mentioned during the pandemic, you allowed people to go home, work, and you even help them out with equipment, laptop, ergonomics, what are the challenges that they faced? How much of that was because you had the resources to do that, you're not tax dollar funded? And how much of that was the culture, really, that sprang into action? So, I, you know, I think there are certainly advantages we have because we don't operate on the state budget. We have our own independent budget. Um, and... Uh, but at the end of the day, the entire state that could do their job from home ended up, my understanding, following that model. That was the direction. I think the cultural difference was key. We made the decision fast. You know, these, there are moments that matter in our lifetimes, right? There are moments that matter in your engagement with any individual, with any organization. This was a moment that mattered. People were afraid. I was afraid. I, I was a little afraid about the pandemic, but I was really more afraid. What if this doesn't work? What if we send everyone home and it doesn't work? And instead of letting that fear rule my decision making and take longer, 
the decision making was ruled by what does our North Star say? And I will candidly admit, I knew this was a moment that mattered. People were going to evaluate us based on what we did in this moment. And their biggest concern was their safety. And I think our culture uh, drove us to handle this much differently than most of the rest of the state. In fact, we got, we got in trouble with some of our sister agencies because, you know, before any of the Bay Area counties said shelter in place, I told our employees, you cannot attend that outside training that the Division of Industrial Relations is putting on. There's a pandemic. It's not safe. We're not going. So you know, usually we have a great number of people attending there. We just stop showing up. We got calls from other agencies saying, hey, you're making us look bad. We have to do what the governor says. So I think there is a different culture um, that we've been able to create here. And that be, that is part of the financial independence that we have from the state. Not, I don't think that everyone could do that. If we were a different agency, I think we could do a lot of it. Yeah, but there are certain things you can't do. And that's, I learned that when I joined this organization, when I started working for the state, there's lots of things I can't do at state fund that I could have done somewhere else. I'm not going to worry about those things until I've done everything that I can do. And that's what I would say to any other agency head as well. You, there might be a longer list of things that they can't do than what we can't do. But until they've done everything they can, don't let those things be a cop out or an excuse because you know, there's a lot that we can do. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, our audience, truly appreciated the wealth of information and the cultural guidance that you offered. And I know you mentioned that you're not Apple, but in my book, you could be the equivalent of Apple in state service and employer of choice. So thank you for being the best employer. Thank you. We appreciate that. Our, our vision really is to be the insurance carry of choice for California. And to do that, we have to be the employer of choice as well. So it, it just it warms my heart to hear you say that. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone. Great. Thank you. And have yourself a terrific day. Okay. Bye, everyone.